Fundamental to this message-carrying process is the nerve impulse, the language of the nervous system. The anatomy of the human nervous system has been the object of scientific study for many centuries. But the way this system carries messages remained unknown until the late 1700s. Luigi Galvani, an Italian professor of anatomy, begins to unravel the mystery in the 1780s. He undertakes a series of experiments investigating the effects of electricity on muscles and nerves. During one of these, he notices that when a frog nerve is touched by metal and a spark is discharged nearby, the muscle attached to the nerve contracts. Galvani reasons that since muscles can be activated by an external electrical stimulus, the normal internal stimulus may also be electrical. For years, he continues his attempts to prove this theory but it is not until near the end of his career that he succeeds. He dissects a nerve and touches the cut end to an exposed muscle. The muscle served by the nerve contracts. Good evidence that muscles and nerves can produce an electrical stimulus. Some 40 years later, Emile dubois Raymond, a German-born physiologist, seeks to prove that nerve impulses are, in fact, small electric currents generated by the nerve itself. He lays a nerve across two electrodes which are connected to a very sensitive galvanometer. The meter reads zero. No current flows in the nerve. Then he crushes one end of the nerve to expose its interior and places the exposed end on one of the electrodes. Now an electric current does flow in the nerve. This current, generated within the nerve itself, can only be the result of a difference in electrical potential between the inside and the outside of the nerve. Further experiments lead du Bois-Raymond to believe that this current flows through the nerve in much the same way and at the same speed as electricity does through a wire. In 1850, Hermann von Helmholtz, a German physicist, is able to measure the speed of the nerve impulse. He employs two electrodes in his experiment. One is used to stimulate the nerve, the other to record the contraction of the attached muscle when the nerve is stimulated. The electrodes are connected to a recording device, in this case an oscilloscope. The nerve is stimulated. The stimulus is recorded on the lower beam and the muscular contraction, which occurs several milliseconds later, on the upper beam. Now the stimulating electrode is moved five centimeters closer to the muscle and the nerve is stimulated again. The muscle contracts 1.5 milliseconds sooner. This shows that the nerve impulse has traveled the 5 centimeters in this time, or at a speed of 33 meters per second. This speed is typical of impulses in many nerve fibers, and it is much slower than the speed at which electricity travels through a wire. Julius Bernstein, another German scientist, devises a theory which accounts for both the slow speed and the source of the nerve impulse. Bernstein suggests that the difference in electrical potential between the inside and the outside of nerve fibers is due to the presence of ions. Nerve cells, he theorizes, are surrounded by a very thin membrane, 
which maintains a greater concentration of negative ions inside the cell than outside. This creates an electrical potential. The arrival of a stimulus causes ions to move back and forth across the membrane. This generates a small electric current that moves from point to point along the nerve fiber. This current, Bernstein believes, is the nerve impulse, and its relatively slow speed is determined by the physical properties of the membrane, which are different from those of a wire. In the late 1930s, Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley of England developed the membrane theory more fully. They are able to measure the electrical activity within a single living nerve fiber. To accomplish this, they insert microelectrodes, which have extremely fine tips, into an isolated nerve fiber of a squid. With both electrodes placed just outside the fiber, the oscilloscope indicates no difference in electrical potential between them. One of the electrodes penetrates the fiber. The drop in the beam indicates that an electrical potential exists across the fiber membrane. This is called the resting potential. But when the fiber is stimulated, the resting potential is interrupted for less than one millisecond. This interruption is called the action potential, and it shows that a nerve impulse has passed that point on the fiber. Thus the work of Hodgkin and Huxley, and the refinements made by other scientists, have led to better understanding of nerve impulse conduction. The principal ions involved in impulse conduction are sodium ions and potassium ions. In the resting cell, most of the sodium ions are concentrated outside the cell, most of the potassium ions inside. The membrane which surrounds the cell is relatively impermeable to sodium and potassium ions while the cell is at rest, and therefore helps maintain the unequal concentration of ions. As a result, the inside of the cell is negatively charged relative to the outside. When a stimulus arrives at a point on the membrane, that point becomes permeable to sodium and potassium ions. First, sodium enters the cell, making the interior of the cell positively charged. An instant later, potassium ions move out of the cell, making the inside negatively charged once more. Then sodium leaves the cell and potassium re-enters. The original electrical potential is re-established and the membrane is ready to respond to the next stimulus. The small electric current generated by this movement of ions stimulates the adjacent point on the membrane. In this way, the nerve impulse is conducted from point to point along the fiber. This theory is fundamental to understanding other characteristics of how nerves carry messages. One of these characteristics is the strength of the stimulus required to trigger an impulse. One trace will indicate the response of the cell, another stimulus intensity. When a certain level of intensity is reached, the nerve cell fires. This level is the fiber's threshold. Once this threshold has been reached, increasing the intensity of the stimulus will not increase the intensity of the response. The nerve fiber either fires with all its strength or it doesn't fire at all. This is the all or nothing principle. 
Another characteristic of impulse conduction concerns the ability of the cell to respond to successive stimuli. The fiber is unable to respond to the second stimulus because more than two milliseconds must pass before the cell membrane can respond again. This interval during which the cell will not respond to any stimulus is called the refractory period. Because of it, nerve impulses, no matter how rapidly they follow one another, are all separate individual bursts of energy. The refractory period and the all or nothing principle. Both are necessary to understanding how nerves actually do carry messages. In this case, messages about the relative intensity of stimuli. An instrument which can apply varying amounts of pressure is used to stimulate the animal's foot. Each stimulus is applied continuously for a fixed length of time. The strength and duration of each stimulus are indicated on an oscilloscope. A microelectrode is inserted into an intact sensory nerve to detect the response. A stimulus of a given strength triggers a certain number of impulses. Not all nerve fibers respond the same way to the same stimulus. Despite differences among individual nerve fibers, they all conduct bursts of impulses. The electrochemical properties of all impulses are similar, but the frequencies and duration of these bursts are different. These differences form a code which the brain interprets and uses to direct the body's responses. But conduction is only part of the process. The nerve impulse must also be transmitted from one nerve cell to another and thus through the nervous system. For centuries, scientists believe that the nervous system is a vast physically interconnected network similar to a spider web or the electrical wiring in a house. In the early 1900s, Santiago Ramón y Cajal, a Spanish histologist, challenges this theory. Using new techniques, Cajal shows that although nerve cells do touch one another, they are not physically interconnected. Instead, they end in clusters of knob-like structures. And between the endings of adjoining nerve cells, there is a definite gap called the synapse. These knobs and the synaptic junctions are clearly revealed by the electron microscope. Cajal's discovery raises the problem of how the nerve impulse crosses the synapse. Some scientists think that it must cross the gap electrically. Others think that the impulse may be transmitted chemically. Otto Loewy, an Austrian pharmacologist, settles the controversy in the 1920s. He uses two isolated frog hearts that are kept alive in the solution. In the first heart, the vagus nerve, which helps regulate the heartbeat, is still attached. 
In the second, all nerve connections have been severed. Both hearts are beating at their normal rate. Now the vagus nerve of the first heart is stimulated. This has the normal effect of slowing the heartbeat. After several minutes of stimulation, a small quantity of the fluid within the heart is withdrawn and injected into the second heart. Now the second heart beats more slowly. This decrease must be due to a chemical released into the first heart by the vagus nerve. In this way, Lurvie proves that the transmission of nerve impulses is accomplished by chemical means. The chemical, in this case, is acetylcholine one of several substances produced within the body to transmit nerve impulses. Each impulse causes the release of acetylcholine from the endings of one nerve cell. The chemical diffuses across the synapse and initiates an impulse in the adjoining nerve cell. The transmission of nerve impulses can also be affected by chemicals introduced from outside the body. A demonstration with an experimental drug shows how small changes in the chemical balance of the nervous system may affect behavior. The animal's behavior is noted before the injection. The drug is injected and allowed to take effect. The experimental drug, like acetylcholine, is extremely powerful. The way it affects the nervous system is not precisely known. There is strong evidence, however, that the drug acts just like acetylcholine. It stimulates nerve cells directly. But whereas acetylcholine has a very short duration of action, the effect of the drug introduced from outside the body is more prolonged. The result, overstimulation of certain parts of the nervous system. system provides our only link with the environment and the normal functioning of this link depends on an extremely delicate balance of chemicals within the nervous system. If this balance is upset, the message carrying process and ultimately life itself will be affected. Uh -huh.